99.1, the sports animal. Bring in a friend of ours from the sports animal. So good at talking college football and talking recruiting, college football analyst, and uh, just such an expert in terms of recruiting. Super guy, very versatile. Mr. Tom Luganbill joins us here on Sports Talk. Tom, Vince, in Knoxville. Good, great to see your face via this virtual broadcasting world. How you doing? I'm good. And can you imagine that I can do this with you and drive with no hands? I mean, look at this, huh? I mean, I, I got a drivable Jeep. Uh, I, I'm just kidding around. I got my 15 year old driving me here. He's I'm, I'm, I'm juggling a lot of balls right now. My wife had surgery. So I'm taking one kid someplace, another kid, some other place. My son has a, uh, has his permit so he's getting some driving in so here i am doing a little zoom radio with you <laughs> it is a new world i, I don't know how if it's going yeah. back to the old way so let, let's start there how have how has the virtual world treated you as a broadcaster being able to do not just interviews like this around the country but yeah. being able to call games from different locations well that part's been frustrating because you know i you know i'd been with with our crew for seven years. And essentially if, if you lived anywhere near a studio, which basically meant Charlotte, Bristol or LA, you got pulled off the road. And so I went from being on the field and traveling each and every week to really driving down the street and being in a, in, in a Charlotte studio broadcasting games. I will say this, it makes you a better broadcaster. When, when you don't have the bells and whistles, you're not there. It's a very stale environment. You can't see everything the way you can just from either looking out of the booth or from my vantage point at times being on the field and seeing everything right in front of me. The, those days were over. So um, a lot of challenges, a lot of Zoom calls like this. You know, I can't tell you how many times we talked to either head coaches or coordinators or players or what have you leading up to games. And we're, we're, we're talking to them and they're driving in a car going from dropping their kids off somewhere to try and help their wife and then driving into school and then they got to put their mask on. I mean, it, it, it was a crazy, crazy fall. Uh, unfortunately, I think in many ways, we're probably not going to go back just because there's been a lot of cost effective, you know, uh, benefits to this. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know if they outweigh the benefits of, of doing it the old way, uh, but that that's the world that we're living in. And so from a recruiting perspective, it hasn't changed all that much from a player evaluation standpoint. Aside from not being able to get on the road as much uh, and watch kids, uh, couldn't do that this fall. Um, hopefully we're going to get back on the camp and combine circuit. Um, got a bunch of those schedules starting here in March. And so that, whoa, whoa, I lost you. Did you see that? <laughs> <laughs> Great catch. <laughs> you like that, huh? So, uh, hey, 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 lead foot over here. I got my sons over here pressing on the pedal. Um, but no, uh, hopefully we'll get back and see the camps and combines, get after it. And, um, get to see some kids in person, which is so important. Uh, but yeah, there's no doubt it's, it's changed. It's been, I, to be honest with you, you know, it, it's a grind when you're gone for 16, 17 straight weeks from a, a Thursday to a Sunday, it impacts everybody. That's our business it impacts your family, your kids. And so to be able to be home a little bit, you know, during the fall and then be able to come home on a Saturday after a game and actually watch football, that was kind of cool. That was new. I didn't generally get a chance to do much of that. So real quick on recruiting, is there, are you hearing anything in terms of when this long lasting dead period could potentially open back up to allow kids to get some visits in? Uh, I, I'm not hearing anything. I'm not even really hearing any rumblings. I think it's important though, that, um, that they get some form of a spring recruiting period in um, at, at least let the coaches get out on the road, get out in the high school, start asking those questions, talking to the right people. You know, that's the one thing about recruiting. You know, the 2021 class, they had been pretty entrenched in the process by when this thing started last February and when things started to get locked down. But the 2022 class is one that I think has suffered the most from a lack of exposure and a lack of being seen because generally as underclassmen, what are you doing, right? You're, you're attending junior days. You're going on campus to attend a camp and the coaches are on the road and they're identifying, all right, who are the kids in the next two to three classes? That didn't happen for them. Just a lot of catching up to do between the coaches and the players, because especially with the 2022 class, because you just get behind in the evaluation when you can't go out on the road, your kids can't visit you. And uh, so I, I think that there's ground to be made up there. And so hopefully they, 
We'll get some form of a, a spring recruiting period in. It doesn't look like they're going to as of now unless uh, things change. But I, I know this, Vince, the less you get out there as a coach and the, the less you have the opportunity to, to have a kid at your camp and coach him and interact with him and see how he responds, the more errors you're subject to, the more you're going to miss because you're not gathering the information that you'd like to gather. So let's talk about Josh Heupel in that scenario, having to jump in now as Tennessee's head coach for a very short period of time in a 2022 class where kids are already deciding where they're going or at least narrowing it down, like in-state quarterback Ty Simpson, who you're very aware of. And and what kind of difficult job is it for Heupel to try to make up ground in 2022 at this point for him? I think it might help him. Uh, for some of the reasons that I just stated in the, in the fact that everybody's behind where they normally are on their recruiting calendar right now. So the fact that coaches and players could not interact, coaches couldn't go on the road, players couldn't come on campus, um, especially when you go back a year and the 2021 class is the focus, the 2022 class, as I mentioned, I, I think really took a hit. I, I think it stalled everything. And so if you're a new coach, you know, I'll put it this way, been a lot worse if you were a Mike Norvell last year or a Sam Pittman at Arkansas last year where you're trying to hit the ground run, running, and all of a sudden everything's taken away. You don't have that time to lay down the blueprint and in, in, in enroll in recruiting. Um, you barely had a chance to get to know your own team. I think that kind of buys some time for Josh Heifel and the staff because nobody's really been able to get a head start on them. For the most part, they're all kind of starting at square one. So what was, before we get into what Hypo is like as a recruiter, what was 2021 like in terms of the February signing period versus how many kids seemingly every year are jumping on that early signing period? What was that like in this unique year? Well, I'll tell you, February 3rd was the most uneventful, without question, the most uneventful signing day in the history of college football, and that's a shame. I, I think that's a shame. I think we're to the point now where if everybody, if, if players aren't worried about coaching changes, which they're obviously not because they're signing, they know it may happen and they're still signing, it's not scaring guys off. So if you're not worried about that stuff, then you know what I think we should do? I think we just... We have that signing day on that the third, whatever, Wednesday in December. You have the two, two and a half week dead period that follows it, you know, that gets you right past the new year. And then just tell the teams, okay, here's the deal. You have the entire month of January to fill out your class. Do it as you will. Don't, don't make a, a first Wednesday in February date. It doesn't matter. There's not enough guys. So if, you, if, if you're able to sign a guy and he wants to sign with you, sign him. You know, I, I, I say we don't make a big deal out of two of them have one and then have a little bit more open-ended on the backside to round out the class, you know, create a database, create a portal of newly signed guys, the date that they signed, they go in there, get sent out to all the schools. Everybody knows he's off the market. Bing, bang, boom, you're done. Visiting with Tom Luganville from ESPN college football analyst and a longtime national director of recruiting for ESPN. Tell me what you think of Josh Heupel as a recruiter. It's interesting because I don't know if we know enough yet as a head coach in the Southeast. I know as an assistant coach when he was at Oklahoma and they were going out and they're recruiting the heck out of Texas. Uh, I think he deserves a lot of credit um, uh, with the quarterback position and and who they recruited uh, there in Norman. So I, I think that's a positive because I think he's identified good players at the quarterback position. He's been a part of the recruitment of those players at the quarterback position. And then when he's had a quarterback, he's coached them well. And so to me, that's important. Because if you don't have a quarterback, you don't have a chance. That's the bottom line, Vince. We, we can talk about all of these positions. And listen, the offensive line, defensive line, most important thing, prop- look, look to the Super Bowl. Bruce Arians ends up with Tom Brady. The Buccaneers end up with Tom Brady and look at where the New England Patriots are. I mean, it's, it's that simple. So 
I think the focus isn't so much on how good of a recruiter is he is. Can he get a, a dynamic quarterback? That's that's the key because I think Tennessee is going to have access to good players. Are they going to have access and beat Georgia and Alabama and Florida all the time on guys? Regardless of who the coach is, I don't know if the answer is ever going to be yes to that. They might beat up on some guys here and there. Now, I don't know if it's going to be all the time. And so it'll be interesting to see. My, I, I do, my concern a little bit is when he took over at Central Florida, there seemed to be a, a downward trend in on-field production. And this past year, uh, Central Florida was terrible on defense, terrible. I think we all know in the SEC, you better not be terrible on defense or you're going to be in big, big trouble. In fairness to him, I think we all need to take a step back and realize that it doesn't matter if it's Josh Heupel or anybody else, Vince. This is a complete teardown from an infrastructure standpoint. You don't know what, if any, the sanctions are going to be, all right? Is that going to include scholarship reductions, the bowl participation, the amount of coaches you can put on the road? Nobody knows the answers to that question yet or to those questions. And until we do, I think from a fairness standpoint to him, there are some challenges that would await any head coach. So for me, time will tell. Um, it's a big program. It's a big job. There are a lot of challenges right now. You know, I has had somebody, Vince, ask me, you know, what, what, what's been the difference here in the, in the last, you know, 15, 20 years? And I said, well, for one, you know, uh, South Carolina had a run there that they hadn't had before. All right. Georgia wasn't great in the late 90s. Kentucky was below average or poor. Well, now all of a sudden, Georgia's rolling. Kentucky's pretty darn good. South Carolina's improved their stake. The competitive landscape has shifted dramatically. And keep in mind, in the late 90s, Alabama wasn't any good. Yeah. Well, that's part of the frustration also, especially when Butch Jones is at the helm. They didn't yeah. have greater advantage of a down east at the time. Well, let's, let, let, yes, to some degree, but we're also talking about a coach that everybody was running out of town, all right? <laughs> yes. Had back-to-back nine-win seasons. What was he, 3-0 and in bowl games or whatever it is? Yeah. And you're sitting there going, okay, well, wait a minute. What? I, and, and I listen, we can all have our varying opinions on, on Butch Jones, but the program was far better when he left it than it was when he took over. And I don't know if you can say that about the program r- right now. And, and you're right. You're right about that. The, the East was, was, was down. Um, and, and I, you know, my thing with with this job and and listen fans they're the ones who create the passion to fuel the sport right i mean that their passion fuels the sport but there's been an awful lot of people accused tennessee fans of being a very poisonous group that have hurt the program not helped the program uh whether you agree with that notion or not that's up for everybody's you know own debate but when, when i hear people say oh well this was an underwhelming hire well, who are you going to go get? Mm-hmm. Honestly, who, if, if you look at this job, you say, all right, we think we are this. Well, if you are that, then you can go to an Ohio State, a USC, a Texas, a Texas A&M, an Alabama, Georgia, Florida, whatever. And their coach is going to be willing to leave their job for your job. Are any one of those coaches willing to leave their job to go to Tennessee? No. No. So the, the question is, is it underwhelming? Or is your expectation for where your program is right now at a position that it shouldn't be given the current state of the program? Tom Luganville from ESPN joining us here on 99.1, the sports animal on Vince Ferrara. A couple things, and we'll cut you loose. Really appreciate it. No you problem. Talk, you're talking about Tennessee. And one of the things Josh Heupel said, this is not new, breaking news. He wants to put a wall around the state and <laughs> get those players in the state, right? Everybody says that about sure. their state. Yeah. Jeremy Pruitt, though, that door was not only ajar. I mean, it was wide open for yeah. everybody to come in and take some of those players. Yeah. Maybe that was his choice. Maybe that was just inability to close. What do you think about the ability to use the state of Tennessee as a base and then still be able to add to it from surrounding states and around the country? Is that is, How much of a handicap, if at all, is that just relying mostly on your in-state? I think it's a huge handicap because the problem with that state and South Carolina has the same problem is there's not enough elite level power five players within your own state to build an 85 man roster. There's a handful of them. All right. There's not 20 of them. 
There's not 16 of them. And so the example that I would use is a Trey Smith, a T Higgins on Amari Rogers. Um, let's just say you had on average four to six guys a year like that in the state. All right. Well, the goal is none of those guys can leave. You can't afford them to. All right. Because with each one that leaves, that means you got to go into somebody else's backyard to replace it. So let's just say you got six of those in a given class. You sign one of them. That means you're signing 24 other players than that are all from somebody else's backyard. Uh, Now that's, that's daunting. All right. And, um, you know, the good news for Tennessee is they border on really good states. Right. They border on good. This isn't that. See, that's one of the challenges. Let's just say with the University of Kentucky, they can dip into Ohio, but they got to skip over some states to get to Florida. They got to skip over a state or two to get to South Carolina and Georgia and Alabama. At least Tennessee can drive across the, across the border and, and, and Interstate 75 can take them in a, a lot of very, very plentiful uh, places to, to recruit. But yeah, it, it begins. He's Josh isn't wrong in what he's saying there. The problem is this, is the sheer numbers don't help you. You know, I mean, in, in the state, think about when you look at um, because I think this is what's really important. And I brought up Amari Rogers and T Higgins. I know it's probably a sore subject for Tennessee fans, but one of the things that you've got to admire about Clemson is you could make an argument that they are one of the best, if not the best, recruiter of players outside their state that have panned out guys that have not been bust Christian Wilkins, uh, Connecticut, Amari, uh, Amari Rogers, T against Tennessee, Sammy Watkins, Florida, CJ Spiller, Florida, Trevor uh, Lawrence, Trevor Lawrence, Georgia, Travis ETN, Louisiana mm-hmm. before him Deshaun Watson. Okay. The list goes on and on Georgia. So what Tennessee, what they've really got to do is if they're going to go into other people's backyards and they're going to have to number one, beat people on a guy, they need that guy to pan out. That guy has to be a great player for him because you don't have enough in-state guys to be that great player for you. Well, one example is something that you mentioned earlier on. It's the position that you you have to have, and that's quarterback. Yeah. And they went into Texas to get Caden Salter. What do yeah. you think of the Caden Salter in Josh Heupel's system marriage? I like it. I like that marriage a lot. Um, I, I think that he fits really well with some of the wide open aspects that they're going to do, some of the RPO game. Um, things that they're going to do, um, good athlete, kind of a crafty guy. So it's, it's, listen, it's a good fit. And I think that that's the other thing too, Vincent, we probably don't acknowledge enough. The walls have literally been crumbling down on the football building for the last, what, two months. Mm -hmm. And you had a middle of the pack class sign. Josh Heupel just walked into a situation. Now, Hey, listen, can we make an argument? Oh, okay. Well, maybe a lot of those kids, you know, got buyer's remorse and this isn't what they signed on for. They're all there. Right. right? I mean, Josh Heupel is walking into a situation with quality, play. you got Dylan Brooks as a defensive end. You've got the wide out. That's got a really, really good player there. There's some offensive linemen that they've done a nice job with late considering what they lost in the offensive line. So when you consider what was going on around the program and then what he's walked into, I kind of look at that as a glass half full. Now it's got to pan out, right? It's got to work. But it's not your normal situation. Put it this way. It's not your normal situation where in the old days before the first signing period, you had you walk into a job in the middle of January and you've got a bunch of guys that have either decommitted or still committed, may still decommit. And now you've got two weeks to build an entire class. At least you had a foundation in there. That's a good that's a positive. And they have to fit what Hypo wants to do. Are those the kind of players that he wants? So that's a, a, a that, and that's also. tough. Yeah. Right. That, and that, and again, that's a two way street. The, the player, does he feel like he fits? And then does a the coach look at that player and say, well, would we have recruited this guy would, would, and listen for Josh Hypo, he's been a power five assistant, but as a, as a group of five head coach, obviously the, and I did a lot of those group. I did SMU a lot. I had Tulsa at Cincinnati this year. Uh, people can say what they want. It's a different level. The weekend, week out grind of it is a different level. Josh Heupel knows that. So, you know, the right fit and the right guy, it's going to be a big part of the equation. And I think ESPN last check had him at 19 in the class rankings. So to yeah. your point, that's seventh in the SEC. It's hard to catch up there, but 19 still, there's some players there. 
yeah, there's some players, there's a good foundation, at least, I mean, that's a, that's a good enough roster to get you into the bowl participation category every year and then build from there. But I'll say this, Vince, and, and I'm, this is not a knock on Josh, Josh Heupel, and I don't mean this against Josh Heupel, but when, when they decided to fire Jeremy Pruitt, Philip Fulmer's out of the equation. The first thing that came out of my mouth was Tennessee needs to hire a program builder. All right. And fans aren't going to want to hear this. And I brought up Tom Allen at the time at Indiana. I brought up Mark Stoops at Kentucky. All right. You know where that Kentucky job was when Mark Stoops took it over? They were two and 10. They were horrible. It was Vandy. But look at what they've done. They said, oh, what? You know what? There's no magic wand here. We're not just going to paint a stroke across and be a 10-win team. This is a long-term process. And you know what? That might, might, that might mean six to seven years. And you incrementally get better. And you incrementally get better. The fans better start buying into that. Because if you want your program to be good, you're going to have to build it. And you know what? If you don't want to do that, then you're going to fire a guy every two years. And nobody's going to want the job. And you're going to find yourself in this vicious cycle. So my, my advice to Tennessee fans, get on board, and it's going to be a long ride. Is Josh Heupel the right guy? I don't know. We'll find out. But I know this. Dig your heels in for a six-, seven-year deal, especially without knowing what may or may not be coming down from an NCAA sanctions standpoint. Awesome stuff, as always. Tom, what's the next assignment? Where can people find you on the ESPN family and networks? Well, a year ago, I was broadcasting the first XFL game, so there's no more <laughs> XFL for me to do. Um, that hurt you, and, I know. I, oh, man, it was so much fun, man. They finally got it right, too. Um, uh, so really now, to be honest with you, we're in player evaluation mode. I wake up every morning, turn on the tape, get my little cowboy remote, and, and we're and we're looking at 2022s, 2023s, some 2024s. Yes, I, it, it pains me to say that, but that's the reality of the world that we're in. Well, I don't know yet, but I'm hoping to be involved in some of our broadcasting of the FCS level of football, hoping we're going to, you know, they, a lot of those conferences moved moved their seasons to the spring. I don't know how the television is going to work out. We'd love to have some opportunities. We don't know if we're going to broadcast for spring football. So TV's down for a little while, which is, you know, it's kind of nice to take a little bit of a a break from that. And then, uh, like I said, hopefully hit the camp and combine circuit and get out on the road here and, and, and be as safe as possible. Yeah, and you've been a part of those All Star games too, which you know. Yeah, that saying. went down. That 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 yeah. went out the window too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, holy! Smokes. We took care of those kids. I will say this: um, Under Armour did a great job of of acknowledging them and making sure that they were treated well, considering they didn't have an opportunity to have that week down at Disney and playing the game. Follow him on Twitter at Tom Lugan Bill. It's two L's on the end. Tom, there's so many different things we could talk to you about. Do an awesome job on all your platforms on ESPN, on Sirius, XM, oh, College Radio. Always nice to talk to you. Thank and I'm you a good so much. passenger. Look, see what, <laughs> hey, say hi. There you go. See, ha, ha. 15-year-old hey. Quaid getting after it, driving me around. It's like I got my own chauffeur. He's got the hair advantage too, man. Love. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, see, that's his Maho- his Mahomey hair. <laughs> All Top right, buddy. Life. Thank you so much for squeezing us in. Great to talk to you. Be safe. No problem. All, All right. right, you too. That is ESPN's Tom Luganville. I'm Vince Ferrar, ninety nine point one, the Sports Animal.